Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today, we'll focus on something very interesting. I will try to cover the urbanization of Istanbul. Now, let me tell you quickly what I mean by that. There are cities with different layouts in the world. These are cities with grid systems, the likes of which you can see mainly in North America and South America to a certain extent. When you look at these cities from up above, you would see that they have a center where you would have the high rises in one place, then apartments and towards the outskirts, you have the suburbs and houses with gardens. If you look at, say, Europe, we would see a different layout, which is a bit more natural, a bit more human made. There, you would have the historic city in the middle, which expands outwards from the center. Again, similar to the grid system, you have suburbs and houses outside. But it's not easy to categorize the European cities, as you have many different urban areas that have evolved over time. But generally, we see not so many high-rises, a preservation of the old cities and designated zones for high-rises. You wouldn't see them scattered all over the place. Then you have cities like Istanbul, Mexico City, Jakarta, Bangkok. There are certain areas where you would have high-rises, but there are many of those areas. There's an old town, for example, and there are organized areas and not-so-organized areas. Simply a melting pot, I would describe. Now, obviously, I can't talk about Mexico City, Jakarta or Bangkok because I haven't lived in those places to be able to analyze their city structure. But for Istanbul, I can certainly talk about. Now, the reason why we're making this video is to make you viewers understand why Istanbul looks the way it does. And for some people who don't know what it looks like, let me describe it to you. Let's take a look at this drone shot. This is central Istanbul and you have low rises, high rises, historic buildings, commercial areas and residential areas all merging into one another. Now, I'm not saying this is good or bad, it certainly has some advantages because everything is very well connected, there's a nice community feeling all around and that's what makes a city to be honest. You can live in a very well planned city, but if it's a concrete jungle with humans in it not knowing one another, with no community culture, then what's the point? Anyway, this exact mix is what makes Istanbul great. Great. It's a city with multiple layers that have formed up over the course of history. It's a melting pot that's been simmering for thousands of years. Now that being said, let's start taking a closer look into these layers to understand how it all came together. We will divide the urbanization layers into three categories and subcategories within them. This will be the phase one, historic areas, phase two, shanty towns, aka the unorganized urban areas and organized urban areas, phase three, urban regeneration areas and newly developed neighborhoods. Okay, let's start. Istanbul has a rapidly growing population. Well, in recent years, it slowed down a bit, but we're talking about three, four percent increase per year in a city of more than 17 million people. Check this out now. Istanbul was the world's most populated city by around the 5th century. When its population was 500,000, then it started declining and declining. It came down to as low as 45,000 before the Ottomans conquered the city in 1453. Now, after the conquest, the population started growing again, hitting 1 million in 1950. Let's stop here for a second and let's talk about what that means. This slow increase helped the city grow at a steady pace and thanks to the multicultural nature of the Ottoman society, different neighborhoods have been developed with different architecture. Say Fatih, which used to be the main district of Istanbul, has a very Ottoman-inspired architecture, where you would have the likes of Sultan Ahmed Mosque and two-story homes with enclosed balconies. But if you cross the Golden Horn to the Galata side, you'll find a more European-inspired architecture as at one time French, Italian and Germans lived there. If you, however, go a little towards Shishli, you will find the footprints of the Armenian architecture as to this day the area has been inhabited by a sizable Armenian community. Now, it's a very beautiful thing for a city to retain all of these colors and I personally call this the first layer of urbanization in Istanbul where you will find buildings with elegance. Obviously, there were rich areas and poor areas. One characteristic of poor areas of that time stands out 
is the fact that most homes within the historic Fatih neighborhood were built out of wood. Obviously, infrastructure-wise, these areas cannot be compared to the wealthy areas, say, in Galata. But the main point here is that the urbanization was steady and organic. Obviously, we're not talking about a city planning or anything like that because back in the 15th and 16th century, you didn't have that. But that's the beauty of it. Today, if you take a walk in the streets of Jihangir or Galata, you can't help but get mesmerized by the architecture and the authenticity. Okay, check this out now. The 1 million population in 1950 became 10 million in the early 2000s. To give you an idea, in 1950, Paris's population was 6.3 million, London's population was 8.2 million. In the early 2000s, the populations of these cities became 12 million and 9 million respectively. We can clearly see that during this time period, neither city has encountered such a sudden population growth. Istanbul experienced a 10 times growth in the same time period. And with that came the second phase of urbanization. Millions of Turks came to Istanbul with the hope of finding employment in factories. Back in the days, it was said that Istanbul's stone and soil is gold. So in a way, it was a gold rush. And that has led to the creation of shanty towns. These were in Turkish referred as Gece Kondo. The literal translation is built overnight because literally people would find a land plot without notifying the authorities and build themselves a home. The migrants from Anatolia started creating satellite towns around bigger towns so they could be close to areas where they worked. At the time, the purpose of owning a home was just to meet the basic necessity of having a roof overhead. So people just built homes with whatever materials were available and however big they needed or could afford. This happened not only in Istanbul, but in many big cities around Turkey. These types of areas have a lot in common with favelas in Brazil. That's also one of the reasons why the buildings in Istanbul are very colorful. This phenomenon has also left its impact on the culture and the politics of the country. If you watch Turkish movies that were made back in the 1970s and 80s, the migration from village to city, building a shanty home with very little money, blending into the newly set up communities were some of the subjects that were covered. Storifying the facts in the movies were admirable, but those very factors affected people's lives dramatically. Not having good infrastructure in terms of roads, space for recreational areas, space for public buildings, or not having water canals have left many stranded. Whenever it rained heavily, homes in these areas would get filled with water. On top of that, low education level and poverty led to a lot of gangs popping up and consequently, crime rates went up. Just like in any major city around the world, Istanbul took its fair share from gangs and outlaws. These things were also and still being covered by many movies and TV series. You may watch the movie Our Roman to have an idea of what happened in the 1990s in these places. And the series called Chukur that is still airing today would give you a good idea. Today though, most of these neighborhoods have been cleared of the gangs and the crime rates have been lowered significantly thanks to dedicated efforts from the authorities. Istanbul now is one of the world's safest mega cities to live in. Similarly, in politics, these shanty towns were big argument creators. Although the population of these places were small, since they were densely populated, you had more votes in these areas than organized areas. So for politicians, instead of coming up with solid arguments such as we will demolish these unorganized areas and we will regenerate them, obviously that would piss many voters off, Nobody said that. Everybody was like, oh, we'll do something about it. But very little was done. And when it came to demolishing these towns, the residents would object to it. They would literally throw themselves in front of bulldozers and try to stop the municipality from knocking down the buildings. The scene alone had been featured in many movies back in those days. Well, I remember when I was growing up, uh, I thought, ooh, these municipality guys, man, why are they knocking down people's homes? How cruel are they? Why don't they just let people live? That's what I was thinking. But also Obviously, the more you grow up, the more you read, the more you understand the fundamental problems that literally damage an entire generation of people who were born and grew up in these places. And you understand the necessity 
of urban regeneration then. But the picture isn't all that dark though. Following the influx and the creation of these shanty towns, where the authorities could not do anything to put up with, they decided to form new urban areas. I include these areas as a subcategory under the second phase. There are a few repeating urbanization patterns we can see in many neighborhoods that were developed during this time period. Let's take a look at Sultan Ghazi, for example. It's a town that's been planned with a grid system. It's one of the lower income level areas of Istanbul, where you have five six story homes built attached to one another very little parking space and very little room for greenery around the general composition of these types of neighborhoods is that you have a few main streets that have shops cafes and restaurants on the first floor and residential units above them this particular neighborhood has a tramway line but generally in these types of neighborhoods the main means of transportation are buses or minibuses that we call dolmush if we are to look at the demographics of these areas we can see the second and the third generation migrants from Anatolia. Wherever we see the same urbanization pattern, we can expect to see similar demographic composition. Especially in the European side, you have this pattern applied to majority of places. Let's take a look at these five pictures. There's hardly any difference in terms of planning, but these neighborhoods are not the same. These are Avcılar, Esenyurt, Bahçelievler, Gazi Osman Pasha and Esenler. And let's move on to another type of urbanization that also happened in the second phase following the migration. This is Bakırköy. It's a very well-planned area where you have buildings with 15, 16 floors, a good amount of greenery. Every compound here has parking spaces and necessary social facilities all around, such as football pitches and recreational areas. Areas like this in the European side of Istanbul back in the 1990s were highly sought after because they would offer all the benefits that other neighborhoods didn't. Not. But the one interesting thing about Bakırköy and the specific urbanization here is that these buildings have low to middle level of build quality. You can see the same types of housing generally in the European cities where people who cannot afford to live houses would live. These types of houses are called cités in French and also in Turkish. In France, for example, the ethnic and the cultural composition of these buildings are highly diverse because they were built as housing for low income level people and immigrants. Let's take a look at these two two pictures now. The one on the left is a building in France that's not necessarily associated with a higher level of income. The one on the right, however, is a building in Istanbul where people of middle class income live. Now I think we can understand why that is because in the urbanization ladder these buildings are not at the bottom. They are somewhere in the middle. As we continue exploring the second phase of urbanization, we see well-planned higher income level areas as well. These places are Yeshilyurt and Floria in the European side, where you would have low rises, larger homes, neighborhood is spaced out, a lot of room for greenery, recreational areas and a beach in the vicinity. If we take a look at the Asian side, we can see that the Göztepe area in Kadıköy offers pretty much the same feeling with taller buildings. When we look at the demographics of these areas, we see people having higher education levels, lower crime rates, higher income levels and late parenthood. And the last urbanization type again during the second phase are the areas such as the Karyake. These are the areas that are planned for even higher income brackets. It's a suburb concept, the likes of which you have in the United States or in many European cities. In Istanbul, in addition to Zekeriako, you can see this type of urban planning in areas such as Beykos, Ömerli, Reşadiye and Dragos on the Asian side and Zekeriako, Uskumrukoy, Sarıyer, Levant and Büyükçekmece on the European side. And with that, we conclude the second phase of urbanization. Now, before moving into the third phase, I'd like to say that these phases are not definitive and they overlap into one another. For example, just because I have categorized Zekeriyako within the second phase doesn't mean that the growth of the area has stopped and now there are other areas that are being developed or just because the main part of Esenyurt is an example for a phase two type of urbanization does not mean that you don't have luxury developments or high rises that would pass as third phase. Now that being said, let's take a look at the third phase now. The third phase is what I would refer to as newly developed areas such as Beylik, Düzü and Başakşehir, modern compounds with many facilities, the likes of which you can find mainly all around in Istanbul, newly completed developments in the urban regeneration area, 
areas such as Fikirtepe and Bomonti in central Istanbul and high rises again scattered all over the city. Let's start with the outskirts of Istanbul and we'll slowly come to the center. But there is one interesting detail here. When you look at Beylikdüzü, you'll see mostly apartment complexes. There are only a few houses or villa complexes. If we recall the grid system in the US uh, that I mentioned in the beginning of the video, that the suburbs generally contain houses, not apartments. The reason for that is obviously simple. They have space and you can develop neighborhoods horizontally and that's what they have done. In Beylikdüzü, however, there was simply no reason to build apartments, you know, because here you have the luxury of space, unlike Istanbul's crowded city center. Now, you might think that this ha also has a lot to do with the GDP per capita or the purchasing power of Istanbulites, but you would be wrong, and let me explain why. Let's compare a suburban area from Namibia's capital, Windhoek, with a suburb of Istanbul. Now, as we can see, the suburbs of Windhoek are made up of houses and the suburbs of Istanbul are made up of apartments. The GDP per capita of Namibia at nominal is $4,200, whereas the Turkish GDP per capita stands at $8,500, which is double that of Namibia. And when we compare the GDP per capita purchasing power parity, which would give us a much better idea in terms of purchasing power of the citizens, we can see that Turkey is three times higher than Namibia. You can take this one example and you can easily multiply that so it's definitely not a problem of purchasing power moreover you can say that istanbul has 17 million residents it's certainly a metropolis where the land prices are expensive then i would say to you that this apartment complex trend does not only exist in istanbul it exists in other cities of turkey except holiday resorts in the south let's take a look at my hometown menderes it's a suburb of izmir that's 20 kilometers outside of the city center where you would have all the right reasons to enforce a horizontal urbanization with single or double story houses, but you don't have that. You mainly have low-rise apartment complexes. You would come up with an argument and say that you know, but the land prices are just too expensive for single or double story homes to be built. And just because of the land prices, these homes would be very expensive and people could not afford them. Then I would say to you on the contrary, when you're planning a city, if you only allow single or double story houses to be built, and if it's the only type of real estate you can develop to meet the housing demand that would automatically push the land prices down because you would not have the high profitability. And that goes for anywhere in Turkey, including the suburbs of Istanbul. But this is not the practice here in Istanbul. Now, why am I saying this? Because some people are wondering how come the villas in the suburbs of Istanbul can be more expensive than villas in the suburbs of, say, Houston. Well, this is the exact reason why. There is a very limited supply and the simple economics suggests that when you have more demand than supply, the price goes up. Now let's continue covering more types of the third phase of urbanization. We'll talk now about urban regeneration areas and the newly built developments there. Now when you look at Istanbul from the air, you'll see many of these high-rises scattered all around the city. We'll now talk about exactly why you don't have a designated place for them. These towers are generally, but not necessarily, luxury developments within which you have all the facilities that one would need to lead a decent lifestyle. From parking to children's playground, the gym, sauna, hammam, pool, concierge services, housekeeping, I mean, you name it. Now, one argument that I keep on hearing is that these towers, so to speak, turn the city into a concrete jungle. Well, I understand that and I respect that. However, in a city where you have densely populated, unorganized urban areas, there isn't much you can do, to be honest, other than going up. Hey, Aladdin, wouldn't it be possible to build new buildings horizontally, maintaining the certain characteristics of of that neighborhood? Well, no, and let me explain why. Basically, you have a lot of stakeholders. You have the landowners first who demand their share of the pie, which in this case, to be paid by developer in the form of residential units, then that developer has to build some more to break even, and that developer needs to build some more to profit as they're taking the risk. So in order to properly transform a neighborhood where the land is so prime and you want the private developers to do that, well, that's what happens. Now, 
I'm not arguing whether this is good or not, because I believe there isn't an absolute good or a bad thing. It depends on how you look at it. In my opinion, I would appreciate a bit more concentration of these buildings instead of being scattered all around the city. I would also appreciate low-rise projects that would represent the architecture of the past cultures that coexisted here. Then again, you know, that's not really possible as I have just explained and also, I'd like to look at things from glass half full perspective. Now to summarize, again, this is how I see things for myself, that Istanbul has mainly three layers. The phase one is slow and steady urbanization that has happened throughout the years. There are obviously within it poor areas, rich areas, good areas, not so good areas, right? But it's organic. Phase two is unorganized urbanization between 1950s and 2000s due to sudden migration and organized areas where you have solid foundations with multiple different neighborhoods having different urbanization paths. And the third one is the phase three, I as I would call it, is the urban regeneration areas and newly built towers and apartment complexes. The likes of which we can see it in places like Fikirtepe, in Maslak, in Atashair, even here in Beaumonti, where I am right now. Now I have tried to shed some light into why and how, really, Istanbul looks the way it does. From my perspective, of course. I'm not saying that this is the ultimate report about the matter. There's certainly more material available on the internet that you can read from independent sources and also sources from uh, the government websites. I will definitely leave links down in the description box below if you check it. Now, that being said, thank you very much, guys, uh, for watching. If this video have added any value, please consider giving it a like and also subscribe to the channel as I create, you know, it motivates me to create more uh, such content. And again, uh, thanks a lot and see you in the next one. Bye.